Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here. We had the most wonderful trip in the car and I got to see snow and I got to feel cold. <laughs> colder than I have felt for a long time but we were snug and warm in the car and I'm just really thrilled that to be in this church in in this home is um, I know God and his angels are here with us and so we will start with prayer and invite his Holy Spirit yeah. and then we could um, stay remaining for silent prayer dear father in heaven we thank you Lord for all the blessings of the week we thank you for the church in this home because, Lord, it is your church called by your name. And we pray for your presence, the presence of your Holy Spirit, the presence of your angels. And, Father, we, above all, we desire that we would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so we ask that he would walk in the midst of us today as well, that we would see him and our high calling and be prepared for what is coming. We pray that you would teach us the things that we need to know in the time that we are living in, that we may be a blessing to you and to all your people. And so, Lord, gather us in under your wings and um, teach us as we sit at the feet of Jesus and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What I thought we'd do to starting tonight and tomorrow is um, overview the book of Daniel. I, um, I have a great love for the book of Daniel, but I think it's just ingrained in all of us because we're Seventh-day Adventists. And it's the book of Daniel that makes us who we are. It's our, our calling. And uh, why, why are we so strongly connected to the book of Daniel as Adventists? What is it? that has made it so special to us. It's, oh, yeah, all those prophecies of the last days, yes. I, I think also of um, that angel in Revelation 10 that came down. Sister White says there's no lesser personage than Jesus Christ and he came down and he told John to do what? You want to have a look? Let's go to... Revelation chapter 10. In Revelation chapter 10, verse 1. It says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a what? A little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth and then he cried and then he speaks let's look down at verse let's read verses 8 to 11 Catherine could you read those verses and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. Good girl. So there's a voice that's speaking to John, John the Revelator. And do you know who John the Revelator is? Who does he represent? Ah, he's us, isn't he? He's talking to us. And this voice says to us, to go and do what? In verse 8. Take the book. We're to take the book out of the hand of the angel. And who's the angel? From verse 1, Jesus. Jesus is the one holding that book and it's open. 
And in verse 9, it says, um, And when I went unto the angel, so first Gabriel tells him, go and take the little book out of Jesus' hand. And now the angel speaking, so this is Jesus speaking in verse 9, saying, And I went unto the angel, sorry, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, what? Take it and eat it up. So there's two things we've got to do. First, we've got to take it. And that word take it means you take it like it's your own. You take it, it's yours. You take it, you make it yours. And eat it up. What happens when you eat something? It becomes a part of you. And, and we, we know that when we talk about um, the health message, don't we? There's, we can eat things that just go straight through us. Or we can eat them and chew them so that we get every bit of goodness out of them and they get into the cells of our body and they make us who we are. So we've got to take it, make it our own, and we've got to eat it and assimilate it so that it, it builds us up. And it's those passages are talking about what happened in our, for our fathers, the Millerites. They took it, they ate it, it was sweet in their mouths, they loved it, but they had a bitter experience and as um, they, were, they had some disappointments. But in verse 11 it says, And he said unto me, so Jesus is saying to John, us, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. That verse is telling us that that experience is going to be repeated. So the, what our fathers went through during the Millerite time period in the, in the mid-1800s is the same thing we're going to go through, which means we've got to go and take the book, and we've got to eat it up. And so we're going to go over the book of Daniel. We, tonight we're going to look at the stories. Tomorrow we'll look at the prophecies. And we'll go, especially in the afternoon, we'll start looking at Daniel 11, verse 40 and verse 41. And we're going to see how important the book of Daniel is to us living at the end of the world. So let's go to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2. 1 and 2. Rachel, could you read that, please? In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Okay, very good. So... I want you to look at those two verses and list me some pairs of things that you see in those two verses. Can you match some pairs? Have you ever played that game? When I was a kid, there was a card game that you had to match pairs. Memory. Yeah, memory game, yeah. So we're going to match some pairs out of those two verses. What can you see that's pairs? Babylon. Babylon and? Jerusalem. To, to what? Two cities. Two cities. Okay. Thanks, Joshua. Any more? Two kings. Two kings. Who have we got? Uh, and I'm going to write Kim for short and Nebuchadnezzar. So we've got two kings. Keep going. Yeah, and what do we call a house of God? Uh, yeah, well, there, and in the house of God we've got vessels, temples. temples. So we've got two temples. I'll just write the list here. Two temples. We've got the temple, uh, the house of God and the house of his God, which is Nebuchadnezzar, and two sets of vessels. Vessels that belong to each temple. Uh, what else have we got? There's one there, it's not so easy to see, but you've got two lands, haven't you? What's one of the lands? Shinar, yes. So we put him over here. I should have had that down. <laughs> and is it Judah? Judah. Okay, two cities, two kings, two temples, two vessels, two lands. And if you were to read that passage, who does it look like, who's, who's in control? Like, 
Who's got the upper hand? Yeah, because he's, he's besieged Jerusalem, taken people and vessels back into his, his country. He's captured Jerusalem. But who's really in control according to that verse? Verse 2. The Lord gave, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So who's really in control? The Lord is in control, and you need to scratch that on the inside of your eyelids because that's the story of the great controversy. It looks like Nebuchadnezzar's in control, but God gave his people into the hand of Babylon. That's the story of the great controversy, and we really need to get to the bottom of this. Why did God do it? For what purpose? And what, what, what are God's people, what's gone wrong with God's people that they end up in captivity to Babylon? God, God feels the need to do that. So this is a, not only the story of Daniel, but the story of the whole Bible. And so we want to keep that in mind because it doesn't matter if you pick up any kind of book, you'll find in the very first paragraph or introduction the story, the outline of the story that's to follow, don't you? So this is the story and it begins here in Daniel and guess where it's going to end? Where do you think it's going to end? In the book of Revelation. Yes, yes. So let's have a look. Go to Daniel 12 verse 1. Daniel 12 verse 1. And uh, Wendy, could you read that, please? And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Okay. And at that time... Michael will stand up. We give this piece of uh, passage, this verse, a name. Oh, they'll hang up in a minute. <laughs> At that time, Michael stands up. Now, we all know who Michael is? Jesus. He's going to stand up. What does it mean when he stands up? He's, he finishes the work. It's just like when the judge stands up at the end of the court case. It's all finished. What do we call that as Adventists? We give that a name when it's all finished. Close of probation. So here we've got the, the close of probation for God's people. Michael stands up. He's the one that stands for the children of their people. And when he stands up, what follows? Time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So you... Never ever seen a time of trouble like this one. And at that time, so at the same time, what else happens? They're delivered. They're delivered. They're not necessarily delivered from the time of trouble, but they're delivered. So you keep that in mind. They're delivered from something, everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, if you um, go to your notes, if everybody got a copy of the notes, we'll read that first quote from manuscript 107. 1897. Uh, Brother James, could you read that? <clears throat> Revelation is a sealed book, but it is also an open book. It records marvelous events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. The teachings of this book are definite, not mystical and unintelligible. In it, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. Some prophecies God has repeated thus showing the, that importance must be given to them. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. Thank you. Okay, so Daniel is the same book as? The book of Revelation. The same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. So in Daniel 12.1, we see the close of probation. So we need to see the same thing in the book of Revelation. And we're going to see it in chapter 22. So if you go over to Revelation chapter 22... And verse, 
verse, we'll start at verse 10. We'll read verse 10 and 11. Brother Joshua. And he said unto me, Feel not the things of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Thank you. So, in verse 10 tells us that something's going to be unsealed because the time is at hand. Remember we read in uh, Daniel 12.1 that it talks about at that time Michael stands up and at that time God's people are delivered. But over here in Revelation it talks about a time when something is unsealed and then we're told he that is unjust let him be unjust still, he that is righteous let him be righteous still. So Daniel 12.1 is a close of probation. It's Michael standing up. Revelation 22.11 is what Michael says when he stands up. Right? So when he stands up, this is his pronouncement. So they're both the close of probation. So Daniel 12.1 tells us that when he stands up, there's going to be a time of trouble. But over here, we, t we know why there's going to be a time of trouble because you're either going to be filthy or clean. And how do you think the filthy people are going to think about the clean people? There's going to be a time of trouble such as never was, right? Mm -hmm. So we're given different information about the same thing. Okay, so let's have, we want, want to, we're going to have, it, have a look at this um, time of trouble. If you go to your second quote, it's from Great Controversy 594.1. GC 594.1, number two on your page. Before his crucifixion, the Saviour explained to his disciples that he was to be put to death and to rise again from the tomb and angels were present to impress his words on minds and hearts. But the disciples were looking for temporal deliverance from the Roman yoke and they could not tolerate the thought that he in whom all their hopes centred should suffer an ignominious death. So um, what that's saying is, Jesus was saying, it was very clear, you'll read it through the Gospels, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, they're going to put me to death, and then I'll rise again the third day. And he said it over and over. And they were like, yeah, yeah. Do you have people like that in your country? You tell them something, they go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know they're not listening, they're nodding. This is the disciples. Because they're not listening because it says, they, they were looking for temporal deliverance. It never occurred to them that bad stuff would happen. They thought it was all going to end looking pretty rosy. And Jesus was telling them it's not going to be. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed, I'm going to be killed, then I'm going to rise. rise. And they're, they're not listening. It says the words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds and when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The death of Jesus as fully destroyed their hopes as if he had not forewarned them. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was opened to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented. But multitudes, multitudes of who? Multitudes of disciples have no more understanding of these important truths as, than if they had never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation and the time of trouble will find them unready. So she's saying that the prophecies are telling us as clearly as Jesus told the disciples what's going to happen, the events leading up to the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble. So there's two. Now, where did we see the close of probation in Daniel? Daniel 12.1, didn't we? So where are we going to see the events connected with the close of probation? If you, in Revelation 2, yes, but if you're in Daniel 12.1 and Daniel 12.1 is the close of probation, 
Where are the events connected to it? Good girl. Just before it. In fact, the, f the six verses just before it. They're the events connected to the close of probation. So we need to understand them. She says they're clearly revealed. We're going to start looking at them tomorrow. But she also says the work of preparation for the time of trouble. And that's not hoarding baked beans in your cupboard. <laughs> What's the work of preparation for the time of trouble? So I'm, I'm going to suggest that the events connected to the close of probation are the prophecies. The work of preparation for the time of trouble we're going to see in the stories. So we're going to take a look at the stories tonight. Because sometimes what gets taught in Adventism is that we, we separate them. It's like you either got prophecies in Daniel or you got stories in Daniel, but they're very much connected because the stories are actually prophecies as well and the prophecies contain stories as well. So we need to see that they're both very important. They go hand in glove in the book of, book of Daniel. So let's, we're going to go into the stories and we're going to see what prophetic lessons they're telling us and what preparation for the time of trouble means. So where will we start? Now this is an open book quiz because you know the stories of Daniel. You, you, so if you go to Daniel chapter 1, this is our first story. And we already read the first two verses. We know that God's people have been taken captive into Babylon and who ended up being taken captive as well? Daniel and his, and his three friends. And they're confronted with a test, aren't they? They're confronted with a test. Let's, um, um, let's, I tell you what, let, let's do this. Go to Revelation chapter 14. Because Daniel and Revelation are the same book, right? Go to Revelation chapter 14 just so that we um, familiarize ourselves with this again before we look at Daniel 1. And let's read the three angels' messages. We'll read verses 6 to 12. 6 to 12. Catherine, would you do that for us? 14. Yes. Yes. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Thank you. So that's your first angel's message. Okay, keep going. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and may seek his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the, of the Lamb. And 11 and 12. 11 and 12. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Thank you. Okay, so we've just familiarized ourselves with the three angels' messages. The first angel, fear God, give glory to him because judgment's coming and worship him. Second angel is? Babylon's fallen is fallen. Third angel is? A warning. That's it. A warning against receiving the mark of the beast or his image. And at the end of that, we've got a de declaration. Here are the patience of the saints. Here they are. That keep the, that, um, uh, keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. The people that have gone through these three testing messages. So now let's go back to Daniel chapter 1. Because Daniel and Revelation are the same book, remember? What are we going to see in Daniel chapter 1?
test, yes. And Rachel, would you like to read um, verses 3 to 5? And the king spake unto Ashkenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding in science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, of whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Thank you. And, and would you like to read verse 8? But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Thank you. Daniel chapter 1 is giving what message? What message does it remind you of? Did, um, did Daniel fear God? He feared God more than he feared the king, didn't he? Did he give him glory? How, how do we give God glory? What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Yes. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Did Daniel want to glorify God in his body? Yeah. Why did he want to do that? Because judgment was coming. Was Daniel judged? Let's go to um, verse 12. Wendy, verse 12. Through thy servants I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And verse 13. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance, countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So we've got a judgment, haven't we? Mm -hmm. But there's another judgment in chapter 1 as well, isn't there? Would you like to read verse 18 as well? Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, sorry, keep going. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Yep, and in, all and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Thank you. So he was judged twice, wasn't he? Daniel feared God, gave him glory because judgment was coming. And we see the first angel's message lived out in Daniel chapter 1, it's the first angel's message. And he was um, found ten times wiser. And notice in verse 21 it says, And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So, um, yeah, actually that's a, a lot of prophetic understanding in that. But basically he was at the beginning of of the captivity and at the end of the captivity, wasn't he? <laughs> right? So uh, Daniel goes through the whole, um, D Daniel represents us as well and goes to um, the fall of Babylon. So Daniel chapter 2, you know Daniel chapter 2? It's a story of what? Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Um, and it illustrates, what do we see in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? He sees the great image and what ends up happening to the great image? Gets crushed. And that image starts with Babylon, literal Babylon, and ends with spiritual Babylon. God illustrates the end from the beginning, doesn't he? And where does the stone hit? 
spiritual Babylon. So what message would we call that? Because what happens to the image? The it's the second angel's message. It's actually forecasting the fall of Babylon, isn't it? It's the second angel's message. Okay, now, who understood the second angel's message? Who understood that image? Nebuchadnezzar. How did Nebuchadnezzar get to understand it? Through Daniel. Daniel and his three friends. Yeah. Where, how many children were taken captive in Daniel chapter 1? We don't know, but a lot. How many passed the test of Daniel chapter 1 in judgment? Only four of them, right? So who understood the message in Daniel chapter 2? If you don't pass the first test, did you go on to take part in the second test? No. You had to pass the first angel's message to take part in the second angel's message, right? And it says we read that. He was made... Oh, no, we didn't read that. But back in chapter 1, verse... Verse 17, it says, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Who's Daniel? We are. Right? If we keep the first angel's message, fear God. Fear God. Don't fear the king. Give glory to him because judgment is coming. And worship him. And that's what we're doing here on the Sabbath, isn't it? And then God gives us understanding in all visions and dreams so that we can understand the second angel's message in the fall of Babylon. All right, Daniel chapter 3. What was Daniel chapter 3 about? Open book quiz. Do you remember what happens in Daniel chapter 3? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ellen, would you like to read... This is one of my favourite verses, actually. Verses 16 to 18. You know the story. Here's the three boys being brought before the king because they would not bow down to what? The image. And what did they tell the king? Yes. yes. 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego all answered and said, to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. And if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Sorry, but isn't that strong language? Yes. yes. Yeah. You know, Nebuchadnezzar gave them a second chance. You know the story. They didn't bow down. He was angry. He said, all right, I'll give you another chance. And what did they... They basically told him what he could do with his second chance. <laughs> we, we don't need it. All right? Live or die, we're not doing it. What had made them so strong? The experience of Daniel 1, the knowledge they got in Daniel 2 prepared them for what was coming in Daniel 3. What, what, did, they, what did they learn in Daniel 2? What was Daniel 2 about? I'm a very poor drawer, but you got the... You got the they, where did they see that before? So what did they recognise when they got to here? It's like, oh, they knew it. They'd seen it. But what, they would never have seen it unless they had passed the test of Daniel 1. Everything was leading up to this here. Daniel chapter 3 is the third angel's message, which is a warning of the mark and his image. So in Daniel chapter 3, what do we see? Do we see a close of probation? Yeah. Yeah, you either, because, okay, we've um, we got, we got a whole group of children that have been taken captive here, haven't we? Some of them didn't fear God. They feared the king. 
So they didn't glorify the, the God in their bodies. And so when judgment came, they didn't even take part in that judgment. They weren't 10 times wise. So when you got to Daniel 2, where were they? Did they have an understanding of the visions and dreams? And what were they doing in Daniel chapter 3? Kissing the dirt. Right, so two classes of people, God's people that were taken captive were developed in this process. And in this process, we see a close of probation. Do we see a time of trouble that such has never been seen before? What was the time of trouble? The furnace. So there's our furnace. All right, what came first? You had to recognize the image, didn't you? That was, where's your test? Was this a test? This was your test, wasn't it? Because when they were given a second chance, did they, didn't, they didn't even think that was a test. They were like, so what? Live or die. We, we, the, there's a work of preparation this is our time of trouble. But this is our close of probation. Because when the call goes out to worship this, you've either got to know what to do or not. You either bow down or you don't. Time of trouble, that, that's after. So this is the work of preparation for the time of trouble. But this isn't the part we're to worry about because who's with us in the fiery furnace? Yeah, yeah. We don't, we don't have to, there's a, the, as long as we do the preparation, God takes care of that, we've got to worry about that. Because we need to recognize what the image of the beast is. And the only way we recognize it is to have the understanding of dreams and visions in Daniel 2. And the only way we get understanding of dreams and visions is if we fear God and give him glory. Can you see the progression? Now the thing about that is kind of interesting, isn't it? How it lines up. But... It, we have to have a second witness. Otherwise, it's just kind of, eh, that might work. That might not. God does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. Isn't that what he says? Yes. So we need a second witness. Where are we going to see it? What's Daniel 4 about? You know the story of Daniel 4? What does Daniel have to say to Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar, you need to fear God and give him glory because judgment's coming. Isn't that what he says to him? He gives, now he can give the king the first angel's message. You can't actually give something you haven't lived. Right? But he, Daniel 4, now the king gets the first angel's message. All right, Daniel 5. If this pattern is correct, what should we see happen in Daniel chapter 5? If this is the first angel in Daniel 4, what should we see happen in Daniel chapter 5? Which is the? What's the second angel about? Fall of Babylon. What happens in Daniel chapter 5? It falls, doesn't it? It's a story of who? Belshazzar. So this is a, Daniel 4 is the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 5 is the story of Belshazzar. I should spell them properly. Nebuchadnezzar. I'll shorten that. Do you follow? So what are we going to see in Daniel chapter 6? third angel's message aren't we what's Daniel chapter 6 the story of Daniel and the lion's den so we need to see a close of probation and a time of trouble such as never was all right the, the stories the stories the same but different in in Dan, this is Daniel chapter 3 but in Daniel 6 it's like See if I can. 
like a decree. <laughs> and we've got another cave, but in our cave is what? Lions. Oh, the problem is it's a much better drawer than me. <laughs> okay, this is our time. Was this a time of trouble such as never was? Why? What happened to the furnace? It was heated 10 times more than it's ever been heated before. Right? Down here, time of trouble such as never was. He'd never encountered a whole, <laughs> you know, den of lions. But was that, was that the test? What was the test in Daniel chapter 6? The decree, who you were going to worship. This was an unrighteous decree. You need to bow down and worship that image. This was an unrighteous decree. You can pray to no man, no God other than the king. Right? And the whole idea of laws of infallibility. Yeah, think about that. That always bothered me. Like, we can't change the law. Of course you can change the law. You're the king. But no, we don't make mistakes. We're infallible. So what are we going to see at the end of the world? We're going to see these decrees, laws of infallibility that can't be changed, calls to worship. And we need to be able to recognize this. Daniel needed to understand what the issue was right here and be prepared for it. And basically he was going to do what? What he'd always done. He'd always prayed to the God of heaven. Nothing was going to change for Daniel. Nothing was going to change for the three worthies here. They'd never bowed down to an image before and they weren't about to start. So they, they were doing nothing they'd ever done before. They were continuing the worship they've always had. But they recognized the test and it didn't change them. And so when the time of trouble comes along, was, was Daniel okay? Because he wasn't alone in that lion's den, was he? The angels were with him. Christ was with the three worthies. And, and we know that the angel of Revelation 10 is no less a personage than Jesus Christ. So, you know, he's... Um, uh, you know, we, we will have that company in, um, in the time of trouble. So I want to read a quote. If we read quote number three, and this is from 4 BC, 4 Bible Commentary 1161.6. Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually so that they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. So what I want to take from that is what is the sealing? What does it say the sealing is to be sealed? So you cannot be moved. So you it's something you understand, but also something you experience. That nothing's going to shake you. When the, when the three worthies got to this situation here, they had to be sealed before here. Th this experience here of Daniel 1 and Daniel 2 was sealing them into the truth, spiritually and intellectually. So when this happened... If it be so, the God whom we serve is able to deliver us. And if not, we're not bowing down, right? Same with Daniel. Daniel was able to go through, stand before two kings and give them basically the same message. And so when he got to Daniel chapter 6, he, he was sealed. The sealing doesn't happen in the crisis. The sealing has to happen before the crisis. And it's, I think Sister White talks about that in Christ Object Lessons. Man is never, um, uh, I should have had put that quote in. A crisis reveals our character. It doesn't make our character. I'm paraphrasing and I think you're familiar with that. Okay, so you get the gist of what we've done. Now, um, what we can see happen is two classes developing. Uh, so let's have a look at, 
Um, okay. What do we call the first, second, and third angel's message? What's the general title? The everlasting gospel. And where do we first see the everlasting gospel? Genesis 3.15. Let's read it. So we read, we'll read Genesis 3.15. And Joshua, would you like to read that? I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Thank you. So in answer to the sin problem, God says, I'm going to give you the everlasting gospel. And the everlasting gospel is going to put enmity. What's another word for enmity? Hatred. hatred. I'm going to put hatred between two classes of people, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and it's going to separate you. And that's his answer to sin. We've got, we need to know, well, what's the enmity he's going to put that's going to separate these two classes? Well, we know Revelation is the three, Revelation 14, 6 to 12 was what we read, um, is the everlasting gospel, the, the first angel, second angel, third angel, is that enmity that he puts in, uh, that he he, the messages that he, the three angels' messages that he um, gives out, and that will separate the seed of the woman from the seed of the serpent. It separates two classes, and we see that happen. If you go to Daniel, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter four, Genesis chapter four, it happens straight away. Like God gives the everlasting gospel in Genesis three fifteen, and then we see it immediately illustrated in chapter four. So, um, uh, James, if you could read, we'll read some of that. Read chapter 4, 1 to, one to 8. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Thank you. Very sad story. So the everlasting gospel is placed um, into effect there in Genesis chapter 3, and then straight away in Genesis chapter 4, we see... Um, we see two, two classes of people. Out of those two brothers, which one of them feared God, gave him glory because he knew judgment was coming? Abel. How did he fear God? What, 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 how do we know he feared God and gave him glory? He, he obeyed God's requirements for worship. And what was the judgment that came? Was there anything judged in this story? Weren't there offerings judged? So when judgment came, Ain was find on, found on the right side of the, the equation, wasn't he? So they, they had, both had to bring an offering and um, one of the, those boys showed that he feared God because he obeyed, brought the offering that was necessary. He gave God the glory and when judgment was found, his offering was accepted. Cain, on the other hand, he didn't fear God. Didn't fear God at all. He gave himself glory, didn't he? Yeah. And then when judgment came, his offering wasn't accepted. An enmity was placed between those two brothers. And Cain did what? Killed his brother. And that's the story of the whole Bible. That's the great controversy. 
illustrated right there. That's how the everlasting gospel works. It's a prophetic testing message that separates two classes. And, and it's based on worship. How are you going to worship? Cain, Cain, didn't, Cain wanted to worship, but he had his own ideas of worshipping. And he still went away and worshipped. He moved to the east and he would develop sun worship. But he wasn't going to worship how God wanted him. He wanted to be religious, but he didn't want to do it on God's terms because he didn't fear him. Um, a lot of lessons we could take from that. Uh, and what, what was the testing prophetic message actually? What, what, what did Abel produce as an offering? Lamb, Lamb which represented Christ. Christ. So that, that, that whole offering was prophetic. He could look down, he, he, that offering told him what was going to happen in the future and put his faith in the promised Messiah. But Cain brought, he, what, what Abel brought was a sin offering because he recognized who he was. He needed a sin offering and he knew that the Messiah would come, right? Cain brought a thank offering. Yeah, it was a thank offering. They, they were both bad men, you understand. If you were to see Cain and Abel and walking down the street, they're not going to look any different, right? But one understood who he was. The other one was quite happy with himself. That's the only, and, and it showed in the way they worshipped. You wouldn't have picked it otherwise, right? One feared God. And when you fear God, you worship a particular way. In verse 3, it says, and in the process of time, it came to pass. That process of time means at the end of the week. Right? Sabbath. Sabbath, they came, he, they came to worship. So you've got two people coming to worship on the Sabbath and only one of them is bringing a sin offering. The other one's bringing his thank offering. All right? So this is, me, this is se separating, this isn't separating, this is separating God's professed people. It's not separating, you know, us from atheists, right? It's separating two classes of worshippers. Actually, that's in your notes. If we go to, actually, we'll read quote number four from Second Selected Messages, page 106. The message proclaimed by the angel flying in the midst of heaven is the everlasting gospel. We read that, Revelation 14. The same gospel that was declared in Eden when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what's she saying here? Genesis 3.15 is the three angels' messages. Okay. And then quote 5 from the Great Controversy 507. The spirit which put Christ to death moves the wicked to destroy his followers. All this is foreshadowed in that first prophecy. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And this will continue to the close of time. So Genesis 3.15 is both the everlasting gospel and it's also a prophecy. It's gospel and you can't separate them. They're both the same thing. Now, quote six, Signs of the Times, February 6, 1879. Cain and Abel represent the two classes, the righteous and the wicked, the believers and the unbelievers, which should exist from the fall of man to the second coming of Christ. Cain slaying his brother Abel represents the wicked who will be envious of the righteous and will hate them because they are better than themselves. They will be jealous of the righteous and will persecute and put them to death because their right doing condemns their sinful course. So Cain and Abel, they're in the same family. The wheat and tares are in the same field. The Pharisee and the publican are in the same church. Right? God's not separating us from the other churches. He's separating his own people. Right. What are some other examples? Um, sheep and goats are in the same paddock. 
Wherever you see it, there, he's, he's separating two classes but within the same family. And he does it in that, that he does it through the everlasting gospel, those three step prophetic message. Uh, quote number seven, Christ Object Lessons, page 152. The Pharisee and the publican represent two great classes into which those who come to worship God are divided. Their first two representatives are found in the first two children that were born into the world, Cain and Abel. So get that. He's dividing those who come to worship God. He's not dividing people that aren't coming to worship God from those that are. That's how the three angels' message works. So when we looked at the stories of Daniel, who's God separating? Is he separating his people from the Babylonians? No, there was a whole heap of children brought in the captivity and now he's separating them. He's separating the real deal from the pretenders. Out of all those children, who's going to fear me and give me glory because I'm going to judge them? And who's, who does God use to judge them? Does God, did God actually judge them? Who judged them in Daniel chapter 1? Yes, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, he did the, well, first it was the, the governor or whatever, the, the one that looked on their countenances and then they went, sorry? Yeah, the eunuch did, yeah, yeah. Check. Give us 10 days, prove us. And then at the end of three years and the three angels' messages, they went in before the king and were found to be 10 times better. So God separated his people here. And he's doing that. This is how he's working. He's because somebody has to take a message to the king, and he can't. He can't use people that aren't living the first angel's message. He he's he's going to use those that live the message to be able to give the message. And Nebuchadnezzar represents those that actually accept it. Belshazzar represents those that reject it. Though thou knewest all this. He has to, we have to take it to both. It would be nice if we could only just take it to the Nebuchadnezzars because they kind of like us. Belshazzar doesn't care two hoots about us. And by the time you get to Daniel 6, he's got 120 of his own peers that just want him dead. That's what we're facing. But if we're faithful, do we have to worry about this time of trouble? No. no. But there is a work of preparation for it. We need to know the events connected with the close of probation. Close of probation is shown in Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. And there are events. We need to have an experience and we need to have an understanding of prophecy. And they both go together and they prepare us for what is coming. So that's a lot. I know, you know the stories of Daniel. You know them. All we've done is we've showed how they fit with Revelation and the three angels' messages. So now you read them to understand what, there's so much more in Daniel 1 about the first angel, so much more in Daniel 2 about the second. Now you can go into those books and see them maybe with a bit different eyes, that they're not, they're not just children's stories. They're preparing us for what's coming. What's coming isn't pretty, but if we don't pass this part, we don't even take part in this. They're just kissing the dirt and, 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 and ended up in the lion's den while Daniel was saved out of it. So, I mean, don't we, we all wanted to be Daniels. Don't you ever read those book stories when you were, <laughs> dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. He made it known. That's who we are. We're Daniel at the end of the world. He's, he's, um, he is, uh, our last quote yeah he, he is a type of God's people at the end of the world okay so in Daniel chapter 1 we've got those that eat the um, king's food and those that don't Daniel chapter 2 we've got those that understand the dreams and visions and those that don't and then Daniel chapter 3 we've got those that bound down to the image and receive the mark 
and those that don't. Two classes of people. So the stories show the work of preparation and now we'll go on tomorrow and we'll start looking at the prophecies and show how they show us the events leading up to the close of probation and the time of trouble because we've got to know them both. So a any questions? Oh, good. It, it, it's, it's just a new way of looking at it. Yeah. But you, you can see it, can't you? When we just, I'll, sh I'll show you what we're doing. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Sister White says, Daniel and Revelation are the same book. So we've got to see this, the, the three angels' messages in them. But if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And let's read verse 12 and 13. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So how many spirits have we got? We've got the spirit of the world and the spirit of God. So there's two. So we want, we want the spirit of God. Oh, sorry. 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12 and 13. I'll wait till you're there. You're right. 1 Corinthians, I had, it took me a little while. To, uh, so after Romans, so Acts, Romans. Uh, yes. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. Now, we have received, this is Paul talking, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So how many spirits? Two, spirit of the world, spirit of God. Why do we need the spirit of God? No, we don't want the spirit of the world because then we won't know the things that are freely given to us of God. So we need the spirit of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay, so there are words which man's wisdom teaches, and then there's the wisdom that comes through what the Holy Spirit teaches. How we get wisdom through the way the Holy Spirit teaches is, is told us here. He tells us his method. It's comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And that's what we've done. All we've done is compared. First, we compared Daniel with Revelation. And we compared Genesis 3.15 with Gen uh, Revelation 14. And then we've compared Daniel 1 with Daniel 4. Daniel 2 with Daniel 5. Daniel 3 and Daniel. All we're doing is using the Holy Spirit's method of comparing spiritual with spiritual. The things that are freely given to us of God. Man's wisdom has, teaches another way, but that's the spirit of the world. So it's not rocket science. You start comparing and it's a whole new world that gets opened up to you. But everything is based on the everlasting gospel. Those three-step testing prophetic message that develops and then demonstrates two classes of people. They're developed through the one and two they're demonstrated in number three. Okay. And I need to work on my graphics. <laughs> oh, graphics. So we're, we're going to dare to be a Daniel. <laughs> yes, that's our great calling. That's our calling. We, whether we know it or not, we're actually going through this process right now. We want to be found... We need to know what it is to give him glory and to fear him. That fear is fear. You know, they would, church would like to think, oh, it's just being reverent. You know, that, no, fear God. Judgment's coming. Because if we don't fear him now, we'll fear him down the track. They feared him now, and then did they fear him here? 
Okay, so would you like to close with prayer? Do you close with a hymn or we've got our hymn or do you want to just with prayer? Okay. Yeah, want to sing Dare to Be yeah, Daniel? Absolutely. Let's do it. Four nine seven. By a purpose, for to heeding God's command, honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. Many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand. Who for God had been a host by joining Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm and dare to make it known. Many giants great and tall stalking through the land. Headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm and dare to make it known. Hold the temperance banner high on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm and dare to make it known. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for Daniel and for John and for all the great men that have gone before us. And Lord, we're just starting to catch a glimpse of our great and mighty calling Lord, we want to be so purposed in our mind and heart that we will stand, that we will stand for what is true and that we will honour you and give you glory. So, Father, where there is not fear in our heart, grant us that fear. Where there is not a desire to stand for what is right, we pray that you would grant it to us. Open our eyes that we would understand the issues that are before us. Help us to cooperate with you in this work of preparation, for we know the day is hastening on. We thank you for your book. We thank you for the mighty angel that told us to take it. We want to be obedient. We want to own it and love it and eat it and make it our own for your glory and for the edification of your people. We pray for a good night's sleep that we would awake afreshed in the morning to continue to study your word. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.